Welcome back. Oh. <laughs> I'm to... Ooh, hey, Perry. You're listening to Pop Culture Curiosities, the podcast where I uh, get one of my friends from the film industry and force them to listen to my hyperfixation of the week. Today is episode four, and we are talking about the making of The Wizard of Oz, a very mystical um passed down legend in in hollywood <laughs> history do you know anything about like the making of the wizard of oz i know asbestos snow and supporting characters being very inappropriate around judy garland okay interesting cool so <laughs> um l frank Baum published uh the first wizard of oz book in 1900 i probably meant to have a whole extra section on this in the beginning at this point of the podcast um but I forgot. I for, I did six oh. pages of just other stuff that happened on the set of the on the set of the movie. So I think I was just like, eh, we're good. Um, but speaking of which, we need to go back in time with our. We need to take the TARDIS <gasps> and we need to go back to 1938 when they were filming the movie. Let's see if I can get this to work. Um, come on, TARDIS. 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 You're not the doctor. I don't know that I'm not. Uh, I have a BS in, in uh, environmental science. I'm close to being a doctor, maybe. Anything. They're they're changing colors. Were they not doing that before? Oh, they weren't doing that before? I was not noticing. I thought it was one color, but apparently it's not. Close it up. Cool. Whoa. Spencer will put in the sound effects. It's fine. It, should I do like one of my like? Whoa. 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 It's the past now. Okay, so it's 1938. I, I've always, like, if I could truly, people are always like, if you could go back in time, I just want to know what those, like, 1930s, like, glitzy old Hollywood movies were really like to work on, you know? Oh, gosh. Truly, you know? Because it was probably terrifying, as we're going to see today. <laughs> but it just, all, like, there's just this, this, like, fake Hollywood that exists in everybody's subconscious where it's, like, glitzy and perfect and everybody's pretty and, well, they were all pretty. That, that was real. But, like, <laughs> um... <laughs> But like, yeah, Judy Garland, I had this in notes, but before we get into it, it's just Judy Garland was apparently the, there was a running joke that she was ugly. It will get into that later, but like in that in no place in my brain does that make sense. <laughs> and wasn't she like a teenager at the time? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So or hopefully and I'm guessing they told her to her face. They thought this one of the direct one of the I believe directors would call her my little hunchback. <laughs> Yep. Because why what, or, and was was that Stanley Kubrick? No, <laughs> Stanley Kubrick was not working in the 30s. Perry, get off of my notes. You're taking notes. <laughs> Perry, honey. Perry, sweetie. Sweetheart. There we go. You can't press buttons willy nilly in the TARDIS. You don't know where we'll end up. <laughs> But uh, yeah, I, or I say that because of uh, Stanley Kubrick's treatment of Shelley Duvall specifically. Oh, and that could be the making of The Shining. That could be a whole <laughs> other trip in of itself. <laughs> Perry, honey, I need you to not be here. She's just hitting P over and over. Are you trying to write your name? P P P P P Perry. That's my name. Don't wear it out. Okay, so... Uh, the Wizard of Oz, since 1900, has been a very popular children's book. We all know this. <laughs> she knocked over the glass bottle of water. Everything's fine. Everything's good, everybody. No, the TARDIS hit a rough path. No, I don't know. We're landing now. The bit's <laughs> over. Um, 
Where is the... She minimized my notes, too. Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> so, the MGM acquired the movie rights, um, and the film originally... Um, it was a very expensive movie. Just to start off, uh, this was... They they were planning on making a lot of money on this movie. Um, it had a $2.7 million budget, which I looked it up. That's roughly $57.2 million today. So this was a huge, huge uh, budget for especially Depression-era movie being made, you know? Um, whimsical fantasy was a booming genre at the time production began, uh, as the Great Depression was still a couple of years from ending, and political tensions were causing fear that a war would break out overseas. It eventually did. <laughs> they didn't know that yet. Uh, but everybody was just kind of on edge. Um, and so a lot like with, like, the COVID pandemic where, like, all of a sudden, like, this multiverse, like, superhero, like, fantasy genre seems to be getting really big all over again because everybody's like, huh, we're miserable. Let's watch a movie about other things that are not miserable. Basically, the same thing was happening, which is understandable. Um, Hollywood filled the role of offering escapism to the average American. Um, and there was this tiny newcomer production company, this, this little tiny company, you might have heard of it, uh, called Walt Disney Animation Studios, <laughs> uh, that had just come out with their first full length. It was actually the first, um, I believe it's the first full length animation like feature film with Snow White in 1937. And that was a huge, huge deal, like huge deal. Um, so basically it left everybody else kind of scrambling to replicate like the success, right? It's like superhero movie. Marvel starts getting big and all of a sudden there's like a million other DCs like, oh, we're going to have our multiverse. And it's just like, <laughs> oh, if it's popular, we're going to try to replicate it. Like everybody wants to do it. Uh, Harry Potter was big. So, you know, all of the teen YA uh, angsty novels got movies, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, so in the 30s, this was like very like whimsical fantasy. Um, so everybody in the industry is like, we got to make our own Snow White, right? We got to, and like Snow White, I didn't realize at first how much the Wizard of Oz probably wouldn't have been made if it wasn't for the fact that MGM was pissed that Disney was making all that Snow White money. They were like, we got to make our own Snow White. We got to like find some kind of fairy tale or children's book or something to adapt. Adapting art into a secondary medium is always difficult. MGM was confident, however, that this really highly popular adventure series for children would easily make the perfect film. And they were wrong because the script proved very tricky for the studio to adapt. That happens a lot. Like all the things that are like the book was better or like the movie was, you know, whatever. It's really hard or like it happens from um, when musicals get adapted into movies, too looking directly at Cats the Musical. <laughs> and then looking away really fast. Looking at a lot of a lot of musical movies. Like a lot of musical movies don't really do too well because like a lot they're two completely different mediums and people who don't understand that, like obvi oftentimes it can be, you know, badly adapted. Like the Phantom of the Opera movie. Nobody liked that movie. Except for like my parents. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, mom and dad, I know you like that movie. <laughs> My sister likes that movie. So, okay, fair, yeah. fair. So at least three people. <laughs> I mostly am just like a jerk. I watch that movie from the perspective of like, I've done a lot of stand-in work. So I'm just like, the way that they frame the scene is so unnecessarily complicated. Like he's got like a million like candelabras and stuff around him and it's just gold and everything looks bad. <laughs> <laughs> the stand-in was just standing there like, Oh, I am so glad that you will not see my face associated with all this. <laughs> yeah, the oh. making of that movie is is a trip too. But um, yeah, that that like that movie was a lot. That movie goes down in infamy as like a lot of fans of the stage play don't really like it. Blah 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 blah. Same thing happens with books. It's like it's a different medium, so it can be hard to like translate it because there's some stuff that works in a book that doesn't work in a movie, and vice versa. Um. At least 12 writers were involved in adapting The Wizard of Oz to the screen. 12. 12 writers. Several drafts were written, each kind of building off the last. 
And it seems to my understanding to have kind of been a really expensive game of telephone, starting with the book and ending with what we got in the finished product movie. Because it was like they'd write a script and then they wouldn't like the script. But instead of like going back to square one, they'd kind of build off of that one and then build off of that one. And that's why like anybody who's a fan of The Wizard of Oz and has read the books, which I don't think I've ever read. Have you ever read The Wizard of Oz books? I have not. I don't think I have either. Um Maybe those could be read streams at some point in the future. But anybody who's read the books and then watched the movie knows that they're like wildly different. (laughs) And that's part of it is because they just kept building off of their own ideas. So it ended up kind of just being more loosely inspired by the book, if anything else. A lot of things change, including like Dorothy's way older in the movie than in the books. Um, They kind of aged her down. If you've ever seen Return to Oz, the Jim Henson movie, that's more of like the age that I think she was supposed to be in the books where she's like 10-ish, 8 to 10, um, whereas she's like an older teenager in the movie. (laughs) Something that comes up over and over again while researching old-timey Hollywood is that writers were notoriously drunk. Like when I I think about like old-timey Hollywood, I kind of picture like... (laughs) <laughs> it's super glitzy, it's super dangerous, and everybody's drunk. And apparently I was not that far off when I when I picture that. <laughs> um, they didn't have, like, giant cigars and, uh, or cigarettes, like, as they're like, okay, what are we gonna do? Yeah, I think this. that's exactly what they did, where oh. they're like, meh. <laughs> <laughs> meh, we gotta what? We gotta write the Wizard of Oz, see? Yeah, and they all did cocaine. No, that was, like, more in the 70s. <laughs> oh, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. Nobody probably did cocaine. (laughs) No one can prove that drinking was what made some of the early earlier decisions for the Wizard of Oz so weird. But it would explain a lot of things. Yeah, (laughs) she she's on a bicycle in the middle of a tornado. I love it. (laughs) Oh, that's not even one of the weirder things. Some of the earlier creative liberties that got cut included Uncle Henry showing up in Oz and being revealed to be the Wicked Witch's son, the Cowardly Lion defeating the witch and turning into a random dude. (laughs) Just a dude. (laughs) Just a dude. Uh, And then the Tin Man had a love interest who who he sings to as Dorothy gets sent back home to Kansas. This was originally what they were going to do. I feel like they brought that back in Wicked or that probably or yeah. in Wicked. Like, yeah, that was a thing. I mean, it kind of because you like wanted a heart. I can see where like the thing of like, oh, give him a love interest. He wants a heart. Like I can see that. But I just wish I could see this giant like tin man singing to his girlfriend as Dorothy goes back to Kansas. <laughs> it's like, oh, hello, love interest who has never been introduced until now. I love you. I think she had been like we do. Apparently she does. She was like introduced before in this earlier draft. But like, you know, um, after everything, none of the writers were even invited to the original original screening of the movie. And the head writer, Noah Langley, apparently hated it so much when he did get to see it that he cried throughout the runtime. He was quoted as saying that he loathed the movie and thought it was dead and had missed the boat entirely. He did warm up to the movie after World, uh, the world went through World War II and... He did warm up to the movie after the world went through World War II and turned to escapism media. He says he he saw it after that and he said, I looked at it and I thought, you know, it's not a bad picture, you know, that's pretty much it's not a bad picture. You know, that's an actual that's actually what he was quoted as saying. Uh, Uh, He kind of he kind of appreciated it more after he had some time to think about it. I think casting was also a little bit tumultuous. Uh oh. Uh, Gail Sondergaard was the first woman to be cast as the Wicked Witch of the West. Uh, It's been pointed out by numerous people that her screen test pictures show a design for the character very similar to the Evil Queen from Disney Snow White. Remember how I said they really, really were mad about Snow White being popular? They were like, make her look like the Wicked Witch or make her look like the Evil Queen. That's the Wicked Witch. But uh, yeah, she they recast her when they decided the witch should be ugly and Gail reportedly refused to be made ugly for any film. Honestly, we stand. We kind of yeah. stand. <laughs> she was like, nah, I'm good. <laughs> I will be beautiful at all times. You're welcome. <laughs> Margaret Hamilton, who did play the Wicked Witch, was in real life a school teacher who advocated for the education and well-being of children most of her life and even went on to show... To do shows like Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood uh, to show that kids that they shouldn't really be scared or afraid of her. Um, 
and was on an episode of Sesame Street that was pulled from air and lost for nearly 50 years before being recently refound. I did a video on that. Go subscribe on YouTube. No, I'm just kidding. But do if you want to. Uh, but yeah. after 50 years almost, they found this lost what they thought was lost forever episode where margaret hamilton stars as the wicked witch she crash lands in sesame street and the whole episode is basically teaching kids to deal with their fears in a healthy way it's actually a very good episode and she apparently really like enjoyed doing it because one being a teacher she really liked the idea of like doing anything she could to help young kids like with their emotional development but two she really 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 did not have a good experience filming the wizard of oz and so this was like a, a good chance for her to like play the character again in like a positive way and be like oh that was actually fun <laughs> <laughs> that's good we'll get into more of why she hated being there so like on the set of wizard of oz so much in a second but um yeah she wasn't very happy on the set of wizard of oz she sent she spent most of her time alone and was given awful accommodations in contrast to the actress playing glinda who got the nicest dressing rooms and rode in limos she was the wife of i believe like a like a hotshot producer so uh... nothing against her but like they clearly like she was treated a lot better <laughs> and margaret it's sad she says she sometimes felt like they must have mixed her up with the real wicked witch because of the way that they just weren't very nice to her and she even like margaret would sneak into the actress who plays glinda's dressing room because it was so much nicer than her she basically had this rundown awful dressing room she would when she wasn't there she, margaret would sneak in there and eat lunch by herself in a dressing room that wasn't hers it was just like wow this is way nicer than mine. Um, <laughs> she was treated like a background almost. Not that yeah. our accommodations are that bad, but just the juxtaposition where it's like, look at all the niceness and then look at that. I mean, I guess it depends on which set. There are some sets that we've worked where it's just like, yeah, it's pretty bad being an yeah. extra on this particular <laughs> set. And then some of them are good. Margaret, though, it was just not in her nature to complain. She was always very kind and never bitter and later went on to get tons of appreciative fan mail, which she apparently loved, which just makes me happy. Like she went on when the movie had a renaissance um, a couple decades, especially after they made it. She was just flooded with all kinds of like fan mail and she Aww. loved it. I thought that was really cute. Uh, as for Dorothy, Shirley Temple was the first choice to play Dorothy. Did you know this? I did not know that. Um, because she was, um, I believe this was in a time when actors would sign to a studio. So like, like Shirley Temple, Judy Garland, they were signed to MGM. So like they could only work for MGM. Oh. Yeah. So that's the way it used to work back in those days, I guess. And Shirley Temple was like what they were, MGM was really pushing Shirley Temple, but they eventually kind of realized that while Shirley Temple did have musical ability, she didn't have, like, a strong enough voice for the certain, like, music. So they thought Judy Garland could carry it more. So Judy Garland ended up getting the part. Um, there are there are rumors that, like, Shirley Temple turned it down because she didn't think it was going to be popular. That's not true. They just were like, eh, that one can sing a little bit better. Put that one on set. <laughs> um, Judy Garland, it's not really a secret. And this is just a warm up for like the sketchy shit that went on on the set. Uh, she had a hard time basically her whole life as a child actor, but especially on this set. Uh, she was given uh, uppers and downers. She was basically given amphetamines to keep her working at such a breakneck speed and then basically giving sleeping pills to put her to sleep. And then she'd wake up in the morning and do it all over again. Um, and this created a dependency that unfortunately lasted her whole life. Uh, yeah. Because her mother and producers and stuff were like, give her drugs. That'll help. Don't give her less hours to work. Just give her drugs. Yeah. <laughs> that for that does not surprise me, thinking about the time and and hearing like Drew Barrymore's story about her like her experiences and being like, Yeah, that that sounds just about right. Yep. Um she was often called fat. She was put on a diet by MGM at the behest of studio executives. We're not sure that this happened on Oz, but it definitely happened at least soon after Oz. So all of this is kind of part of Julie, Judy Garland's story. It wouldn't surprise me if this was happening on Oz, considering they were literally giving her amphetamines. I can't, don't put it past them to put her on like a crazy diet or something. Uh, she was also belittled constantly by her mother, who was like a terrible like stage mother, um, and studio executives. Um, 
there's this really sad story about when they started filming, they wheeled out this gorgeous trailer dressing room and they made this big deal about like giving it to her. It's like her dressing room. It's really nice. And like they had like a ribbon cutting ceremony, everything. And then like after that happened, everybody disperses and goes to lunch. And then Judy Garland realizes that the door is locked and she doesn't have the key and she doesn't know who has the key. And like uh, one of the costume people kind of witnessed this like she was like about to cry apparently and like just felt so bad for her and she eventually did get the key but it was just like sad that like they didn't even give her her own key to her own trailer (laughs) right that's how little she like had autonomy it really does feel like they treated all these people like background to get treated today where it's like you can't go anywhere without like supervision which i'm told that still happens a lot of times where like pas will be told to just like keep tabs on on uh actors like at all times like because they can't let them out of their sight but like it was apparently really bad back then where it was like you know when you're an extra and you're like i need to go to the bathroom and they're like you can't go anywhere without being told without being uh told like you're in school like basically that's how the star of the show was being treated gosh yeah i was on a shoot recently where we were discouraged from even going 10-1 oh, <laughs> discouraged from going to the bathroom like yeah. at all <laughs> well well not at all they were just like oh we're about uh i would highly recommend you not do that let's just sit in here and and just wait for it and then when they're like okay you can go like everyone would leave and i'm sure the pa was just like oh no they're gonna they're gonna ditch and it's like no we all need to go we've been sitting here for funny thing about going to the bathroom it's not really something you plan for (laughs) it's like oh boy what a nice perk i get to go to the bathroom (laughs) oh i have (laughs) oh they gave me 10 minutes okay yeah let's go (laughs) great now next next you know it'll be like amazon where it's like people had to pee in bottles like that's like the next step of like horror well that reminds me of of joker where or Joaquin Phoenix says Joker and hearing a story about how a ba- there are a bunch of background on a subway car and they weren't allowed to use the bathroom and someone like Married just story, opened up yeah. the back door and because they just couldn't, they weren't allowed to go. And it's just like, yeah. that's not very nice to do. Yeah, that. Don't tell people they can't pee. <laughs> yeah. Set can be wild sometimes. Yeah. It's just like, sometimes you're like, Oh, it w- it, I guess it was fine. And then there was someone who was like, no, we weren't allowed to do anything. <laughs> We had to get there like five minutes before our call time, or else the studio one or the studio one let us in beforehand. Oof! But that's like a specific one. Usually, they... yeah, yeah. Some of them are better than others. Some of them they're like really nice to you, and then some of them they're just like you can't eat or go to the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> Why? <laughs> what do you mean you want crafty? What's wrong with you? Oh, what do you mean water? <laughs> what do you mean water is a privilege? <laughs> <laughs> Talking about uh, casting, though, I thought, like, there was some serendipity in the casting, specifically of the main three male leads. So, like, Bert Lahr, who played the Cowardly Lion, he fittingly had chronic anxiety and covered up his emotional afflictions with over-the-top comedy, leading those who knew him to point out how similar to the Cowardly Lion he was, which I think is just, like, kind of endearing as somebody with chronic anxiety. It's just like, oh, bless him. Um, Jack Haley, who played the Tin Man in Search of a Heart, in real life was a dedicated philanthropist and known as a really great, like, loving, attentive father, which I think is cute. I know. And Ray Bolger, who played the Scarecrow in Need of a Brain, was known to be super smart in real life and loved literature and academics, which, so, like, all three of them were kind of perfect for the roles that they ended up getting, which I think is great. Um, they were all, like, vaudeville-trained performers. Let's move on to talking about directors. It took four directors to finish the movie. Oh. We haven't even gotten into any of the weird stuff yet. The first director was fired after two weeks when Buddy, an actor who we'll talk about in a second, was hospitalized. Uh, according to this first director, he says he was shipped off to Palm Springs to hide from reporters with the cover story that he was sick because it was such a bad PR thing for MGM. Uh, he soon went on to direct Huckleberry Finn, so it wasn't that bad for him, considering that somebody, like, ended up hospitalized on his watch. Although that could basically be said for all of the directors, because so many people were hospitalized on this movie. Like, a lot of them. Oh, gosh. I'm sure I'm sure the nearby hospital was like, oh, they're filming again today. Oh, getting a steady stream of business. It's not like we have anything else to do. 
Yeah. Yep. The second director filled in for three days while they got a new full-time director. He was known as a woman's director since he had directed many of the female stars of the day successfully. Uh, and he kind of hated that label because then, kind of similarly to now, media geared towards women was kind of seen as lesser cheaper media so like he didn't feel like he was taken as seriously as a director because he was just like the woman director <laughs> which is a very like 1930s thing right ah <laughs> he works with the women see <laughs> he treats them with respect see <laughs> yeah. he sees them as equal how dare he yikes uh he was called away to finish gone with the wind and then the third director was found and worked most of the film basically did all of the oz scenes um did everything but the kansas scenes uh, this guy infamously slapped Judy Garland when she couldn't stop laughing in a scene. Yeah, she just was having like a giggling fit when she was doing one scene with the Cowardly Lion, and he just straight up hit her. And let me guess, that's not the reason why he was fired. Nope. <laughs> why am I not surprised? No, this guy was a lot. Apparently, he was good friends with, side note, John Wayne, and they started like an anti-communist party together. There's like a whole rabbit hole with this guy specifically. Oh my gosh. Then that guy was called away to finish none other than Gone with the Wind. Two of their directors they lost to Gone with the Wind. Oh god. <laughs> it was a long film. They needed, they needed all the directors they can get. <laughs> yeah, I've heard people who like worked as like, there was this guy who is, um, obviously older now but he was i think either i think he was like an extra or some kind of minor actor on um one of the or on wizard of oz and he was like people were like did you know how big this movie was going to be at the time and he was like nah because everybody was obsessed with gone with the wind like this was like the lesser movie like we were all like <laughs> oh. man i wish we could get on gone with the wind which uh, <laughs> <laughs> um so they lost their second director to Gone with the Wind. Then um, the fourth director came in just in time to do... I think this is interesting. It kind of worked out that the one guy basically directed the bulk of basically all of the Oz stuff. Um, because the first two directors worth of stuff kind of got scrapped. Um, oh. Yeah. And so the third director did all of the Oz stuff. The fourth director did all of the Kansas stuff. So it kind of worked out that like... It, if it feels like there's two like very distinct feels to like Kansas and then Oz, which kind of fits like it's because they had two separate directors, which I didn't know until I was researching this, which is interesting. And the guy who did the Kansas scenes, he apparently was really big in the day for like uh, silent films and all this stuff. And so he was just like really good with that, like sepia kind of silent -y thing going on. So it worked for the Kansas scenes. He also was really good at, like, practical effects. So, like, he used a muslin sock. He recorded that and then projected that up. And that was what was the twister, which I just think is oh. very funny. I don't know why I think that's so funny. It's just very creative. Um, there were also a lot of changes made, um, like, while they were on set. So, like, Judy Garland was originally made up in elaborate makeup and wore a blonde wig. And there's actually some, like, test footage and some some footage I think they filmed with this. And then one of the directors came in and was like, that's not going to work. And so they, like, changed all of that. Um, and the director, too, was the one, I believe, who was like, mm, she should really look more like herself and more like a real girl. Um also, Dorothy and the Scarecrow um, slash the farmhand counterpart um, were supposed to have a romantic relationship um, because the 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 farmhand that the Scarecrow is based off of, he um, he's supposed to be like 18 because they say at one point in an original cut that like he was going to like college or something and she's 16. So like he slash her and the scarecrow have like a romantic connection this made it all the way to post-production where they then cut it um but i feel validated because all my life i was like dorothy has a crush on the scarecrow like even as a little kid i was like dorothy and the scarecrow like that's definitely a thing and everybody was like avery what what are you talking <laughs> that's a scarecrow and i'm like look i don't make the rules apparently i was right they just straight up were doing that and then they just decided that they didn't need it so they cut it but like that's why the vibes are like that like there's even like clips you can see it in clips where like when she's leaving oz and she says scarecrow i'll miss you most of all yeah that's why 
Uh, it was the scarecrow boyfriend. <laughs> Everyone must have their scarecrow boyfriend. And somewhere over the rainbow was almost cut. There, uh, yeah. Apparently, they just thought it was like too boring or like whatever. And then there was like a screaming match, and they finally somebody finally got it put back in the movie. But like somewhere over the rainbow is like the song. It's kind of like how they almost cut um, part of your world from from uh, Little Mermaid. Yeah, because they were like, it's too boring. Kids aren't gonna like this. Well, thank I goodness! Know. <laughs> thank goodness someone fought to keep those in. Right. Uh, there was a song that was cut, uh, and that song was called Jitterbug. Uh, there's actually some clips on uh, where you can see them uh, performing Jitterbug. Um, but the dance sequence that for the scene where they perform Jitterbug, which again got cut, uh, the dance sequence cost over eighty thousand dollars and took five weeks to film, and then uh, they cut oh. it. Oh, oh, I'm sure there are people who are just like, okay, this is my big scene. It took five weeks to film. It's going to be great. And then they watch the movie and they're like, what? It's like when you like work for days on like a thing and then you watch it back and you're just like, oh, eight seconds. Eight seconds is what we got for that multiple day shoot. Like <laughs> cough, cough, a recent Marvel TV show that I'm not going to name because I don't want to get in trouble, even though it's already come out and the NDA is up. But I'm not going to say cough, cough. <laughs> <laughs> eight days i was on that set everybody take bets in the comments to see which show you think <laughs> i'm just kidding <laughs> which one I don't, I don't know the best or i'm like i for the people in video i'm sure they could like guess what it is based off what i what uh, what i'm showing right now but yeah <laughs> but i i'm not gonna say a thing no one that i can't no one i can't say a thing <laughs> well i could but i'm not it's funny, I just thought, the first thing I thought of was not what I know you're going for, but then I realized, uh. <laughs> yeah, I'm caught up. Okay, let's get to the onset accidents. There's a, uh. this is the biggest part of my notes. If you can believe it, everything up until now has just been setting the stage for oh, all of these gosh. accidents. My first thought is OSHA, question mark. <laughs> shockingly <laughs> they didn't exactly have the workers rights that we have now back in the 30s and like people still feel um pressured to not speak up about accidents on set uh i was talking about this with natasha because natasha got to do uh one of these episodes when she was here um and we were talking about how like there's so many accidents that aren't reported. So when you hear like this many accidents happen on set, you know, it's worse than that. Like you can pretty much guess because, you know, those are just the ones that they couldn't cover up. <laughs> Oopsies. Whoops. <laughs> just saying. Um, so Ray Bulger, who played the Scarecrow in the final film, was originally cast to play the Tin Man uh, while Buddy Epson played the Scarecrow. If you remember Buddy's name, it's because remember that injury, that hospitalization I said that got the one director fired? partially um so buddy was playing the scarecrow but ray bulger was just better suited for the scarecrow he had always wanted to play the scarecrow that was his favorite character from the original books and he fought really hard and eventually won the part of the scarecrow and so buddy was made to be the tin man it should not shock any of us that the makeup they used back in the day wasn't super safe Nine days into production, Buddy had trouble breathing and was rushed to the hospital. His skin was blue, and evidently there was aluminum in the uh, in the Tin Man's makeup that he had been breathing, and it allowed the metal to coat his lungs. Yeah. The makeup artist swore it wasn't his fault because he used pure aluminum dust, which was uh, thought to be safer back in the 30s. It was pure aluminum, guys. It couldn't be my fault. <laughs> uh, I think, didn't they do like a Mythbusters about this where they like covered people in paint and they, I think they mentioned the the Tin Man because they're like, is gold paint or silver paint different and affecting the skin? But I think so. I vaguely remember that. Um, Buddy was hospitalized for two weeks and eventually recast as the Tin Man by Jack Haley. Uh, he was like the practice Tin Man, basically. <laughs> Like, I always joke with my brother because I'm the oldest. I'm like, I'm the oldest. That means I was the practice child. <laughs> just like, oh, this is what we don't do with the next kid. Basically, they were just like, oh, we almost poisoned that one Tin Man to death. Better not do that with the next one. <laughs> <laughs> Whoopsies. Live and learn. Poor buddy. Oh, buddy. Poor dude. Uh, most of the main characters would show up at 6 a.m. and spend two hours getting their sometimes poisonous makeup done, which reminds me of working on... 
<laughs> Walking Dead. <laughs> the Walking Dead makeup was not poisonous. Just the two hours of makeup is what reminds me. I got there at 3.30 in the morning one time. Yeah, I had a 3.30 a.m. call time on Walking Dead. Oh, uh, I've been on The Walking Dead, but I was a survivor. So my makeup was dirt, dirt, you're good. They put green paint all over me and then it was on my hands and it would get all over everything. Oh, no. And then they'd be like, why have you let your hands get all melted? It's like, I'm sorry, I need my hands for some stuff. <laughs> you have to wash your hands at some point during the day. I'm sorry. Ray, the scarecrow, was put in a burlap mask. Uh, sounds horribly uncomfortable. Burlap sounds like not something I want on my face. He said, you don't realize how much you breathe through your skin until you can't. And he felt like he was suffocating. That sounds like a horror movie. Gosh. Yeah. Because it was like there was no, like, it was just so tight on his face. Like, that's gotta, <laughs> that's gotta suck. And burlap is so rough, too. Like, ugh. That reminds me of... Jim Carrey when he was in his Grinch makeup where apparently he didn't he have to like talk to he had to talk to like someone in the military who was who was um uh, who knew about torture a lot and was basically had to like talk him through like the torture of like having to wear the Grinch outfit or something like that. Yeah, apparently something similar happened to Tim Curry when he was on Legend playing Darkness. Um uh, I believe that's his character's name. Why am I blanking? Anyway, the the like satan character that he plays because he was in such heavy prosthetics apparently it was like very very cult like emotionally i can imagine i can only imagine like they had like uh like these yellow like things that like went over his eyes and like all this stuff and apparently like like that kind of thing just makes you super panicky <laughs> it's not fun it's also apparently one of the reasons why he fought really hard allegedly to not have super heavy prosthetics when he played pennywise in it uh, because he had like been like been there, done that, not doing that again. <laughs> Can't blame him for that. Um, Jack, the Tin Man, uh, got a bad eye infection from the now tin cream paint that was all over his face. They were like, okay, it's not aluminum now. It's just tin cream paint. So he got a terrible eye infection, had to be set. He had to be offset for a while to recover. He also couldn't sit or lie down in his costume, so they would legit prop this man up on a board where he would fall asleep standing up from exhaustion. Oh my god! Yep. <laughs> yes, yes, they did that. I almost fell asleep. I started dozing off, uh, leaning up against a pillar when I was working on The Gifted one time because we were moving and we were also doing some really long days on The Gifted and I was really tired. This man, like, literally was just, like, going to sleep. Like, okay, I'm going to lean against this board and go to sleep. <laughs> uh, so the Tin Man's outfit and the Ruby Slippers also threw horrible reflections and would completely stop scenes because they would throw reflections to these old-timey cameras and then just completely ruin the take. Um... They would apparently sometimes use up to nine cameras at one time to get the shot. At I know. One time? I had to, like, verify this but through, like, a few different sources because I just straight up didn't believe it. I was like, nine? What? I want to know the camera setup now. It's like, how did they do this? Were they, like, right next to each other? Was like they're like a dolly and someone be, like, over right? here? I'm that just sounds insane. Even today, that would be insane. This is, like, big, bulky, old-timey cameras. Uh, Bert, the lion, suffered on the the most, arguably, on the very hot set because the lion suit was made out of real lion's hide. Boo. We don't we don't stand that. Uh, it also weighed 90 pounds. Uh, and like all of these lights were like used to like keep the set very bright. So it was super hot. And he's like got this actual like lion's hide that he's wearing. He also had prosthetics on his face, so he could only sip soup through a straw at mealtimes. Oh. I know. Margaret, who played the Wicked Witch, was covered in toxic copper paint uh, and had to eat her lunch super carefully. <laughs> Apparently, she could only eat, like, peanut butter sandwiches, and they would just kind of, like, have to be wrapped with like paper around it because they were worried about the toxic paint that was on her face getting into her mouth and ingesting it because it could poison her. Um, 
She also nearly died when she got badly burned filming her exit from Munchkinland, you know, where she's like, I'll get you and your little dog too. Ah, ha, ha. And then she disappears in smoke. So apparently one of the takes filming that, uh, the like trap door lowering thing malfunctioned and the pyrotechnics went off at the wrong time and she got super burned. Her face and arms specifically were badly hurt, and her hat and broom were completely on fire. She didn't even realize how bad it was because she was kind of in shock, I think, until she looked down and saw that the skin of her hand, I'm so sorry, the skin of her hand was gone. That's how bad the injury was. (sighs) Yeah. Yep. Uh, And then there was the toxic paint that they had to rush to get off of her before it poisoned her by getting into these open wounds. Sounds horrifying. Uh, They did this by using rubbing alcohol and scrubbing it off, which can you imagine how painful on these burns? What sounds like third degree burns. And then she's like got rubbing alcohol and ooh, ooh, poor lady. She was sent to the hospital where the studio had the nerve to call and ask when she'd be back. They're like, so when you coming back to work? I know we almost killed you. When you coming back to work? This pissed off the doctor so much that he snatched away the phone from her and yelled at the execs to tell them to never call her room again and that she'd come back when he was good and ready to send her. And he also told them they ought to be sued by Margaret for every penny they had. He was not playing around. I know. Not all heroes wear capes. <laughs> um, um, she did not sue them because she was fear afraid of being blacklisted, something that's still true to this day. Actors and crew members and extras alike all get hurt and then don't sue because they're like, oh, I don't want to never work again. Because Hollywood is is super healthy sometimes in the way that it works. <laughs> when she got back to set, they tried to put her in a flame-resistant suit and let her maybe get burned again to film a different scene, a scene where she was taking off on her broomstick out the window. And she was like, nah, (laughs) that's not going to happen. Absolutely not. Um, They said, get on the broomstick that's like raised in the air. It might explode. Thanks. Bye. And then she refused to do that for very good for her. Um, So she only ended up doing the close-ups while her stunt double, who had already sustained injuries on set when one of the crew members fell down an elevator shaft and landed on top of her, Uh, she, being the stunt double, did the um, more dangerous, it might explode and burn you stuff, while Margaret just did the the close-ups. So Margaret warned her stunt double, Betty, about the fact that the pole they were right near could explode. Uh, Then she went home because she was like, I'm done with this. She then received a phone call that Betty was in the hospital because shockingly the pole had exploded just like she was afraid it would. Oh no. Yep. Poor Betty. Poor both of them, honestly. Yeah. I mean, (laughs) it's like, Oh hi, you have, they're almost third degree burns on your hand and you have burns on your face. We need to put in rubbing alcohol to get the toxic pain off you. And now we're asking when you're going to come back after going to the hospital. And then this pole exploded. Betty said it felt like her scalp was going to come off. Her hat flew off while she was dangling in the air from the broom and holding on for dear life. And later when she was laying on the ground, having her two inch injury looked at she gets yelled at by the costume lady who runs up and is like where's the hat what did you do with it you know i have to return it it's just like lady Uh. (laughs) i mean i i i've known some wardrobe individuals where i would not be shocked if they did that unfortunately no i've been there Uh, i have not had that bad of an injury and had them yell at me while i was there but i've had some pretty ununderstanding um wardrobe people who are like oh those shoes are literally cutting into your feet and you're bleeding you can wear them for like two more days right <laughs> <laughs> just don't get blood on or red body juices on and though. then you get blood on them and they're just like you bled on our shoes it's like yeah because you put me in shoes that were cutting into my feet <laughs> oh and and did or what or and natasha's just like oh hi medic may i please have a band-aid sure why oh i'm bleeding into my shoes you're white oh yeah it's fine yeah our friend natasha literally was just like oh i'm bleeding let me go get a band-aid and the medic was like what 
I almost rolled my, well, I did roll my ankle. I almost passed out one time on a set because they put me in five inch heels and there was nowhere to sit down. And girls were passing out because they were locking their knees because that's what you do when you're in really high heels and you can't sit down. And I was afraid of passing out. So I was like in so much pain. It was cutting into my feet. I was afraid of passing out. So I like started to lose my balance. I caught myself. I tried to catch myself, but then my ankle rolled and I fell on the ground. This was like hour 15. Um, and I was in so much pain. I just straight up kind of started crying. Oh. I know. And they came over. The AD was like, I'm so sorry. He was literally like, I know you're booked to come back, but if you don't, we don't blame you. Oh god. I did yeah. go back. I just wore fl- I just was like, I'm wearing flats. And the AD was like, if they try to put you in anything other than flats, come and get me. And I was like, I will. And the wardrobe lady did not like me, but she got over it. Oh, uh, how dare you not wear these five inch heels and stand in them for hours on end and, yeah, s- and then switch to flats? <laughs> you're you're opulent. You own everything. Women who own everything wear heels, apparently. Apparently. <laughs> Uh, so two of the flying monkey actors were hospitalized after their wires broke and they fell. Yep. Even the dog that played Toto suffered anxiety from being on this chaotic set. Oh. I know. I can accept everything else. Oh, but no. This po- no, I'm just kidding. But the dog. Oh, my God. Not the dog. He, she was stressed. It was a girl that played Toto, by the oh. way. She was very stressed. I would have also been very stressed. I mean, just here. I mean, they they let the Wicked Witch catch on fire. And the do- dog is probably like, what is happening? Only once did the cast try to eat lunch in the studio commissary, but people were so upset by their appearances that the studio told them they would pay for their lunches if they ate in their dressing rooms. Pause. Can you imagine having to pay for lunch on set now? That would never fly nowadays. Oh my gosh. I would I would just go hungry all day and drink water and hope for the best. Like, if you ever work on set, you're going to get lunch. That's like the, the only benefit you have. Apparently back in the 30s you still had to buy your lunch in all of this. Oh gosh. <laughs> but I'm sure I'm sure but someone's like, well in with inflation they make a lot more and would be able to pay for their stuff, but it's like but why not have them provide the food? Especially after they're putting everybody's life in danger. I think the least they could do is get them lunch i'm just like water is a privilege but i was just in the hospital well too bad you're here now and it's like oh many who worked in the prop department also suffered toxin exposure at one one was quoted as saying that there was very little ventilation in the prop room so you just had to kind of stand it for as long as you could and later he spent weeks coughing up yellow and black sulfur mucus Oh, gosh. There's no way to say that delicately. I remember I was on a set that I'm also not going to say, but I'm going to say... Or, yeah, I'm, but basic, they didn't pump in... Or usually on sets, they pump in smoke because it adds to the ambiance. Or, and it's like, m- like a misty smoke. They literally pumped in air pollution, like dust. Not Or, yeah, they literally pumped in dust to the set to get to get this the feel that they wanted and just going in there i didn't go in that often even though i worked several days on it and it the air just felt heavy i was just like oh my gosh and there were people who had asthma that was like uh, (laughs) that were like that was leaking like black mucus and i like had to i was like blowing my nose i looked down it's black and it took me like 12 tissues just to try to get the black out and i was like one of the people who wasn't even on set that long yikes i had this once where um they were using like heavy heavy amounts of just like the smoke that they use right it's not toxic or anything it's just it's very annoying if you have allergies it's very it agitates you um and on this particular set they at least made sure that like we had masks this was pre-covid so like the like the whole like ooh wear a mask was like novel <laughs> um but i was standing there and they're filling the whole room with smoke and this uh guy who was i believe our um our stunt coordinator i think it was a stunt coordinator he looks at me and he just goes it was better than what they did back in my day. And I'm like, really? What did they do back in your day? He's like, we burned tires. And I'm just like, you what? He's like, yeah, we just would burn tires. And then that would give us the smoke. And I'm like, holy 
toxins, Batman. <laughs> have have you been to a doctor, sir? Are you okay? <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, I I can't imagine. Like, but but I'm sure I'm sure people who who thought of those ideas were like, we're not going to be near the smoke, and they burn for so long, we can just burn the tires. No one had any education of like what could potentially give you cancer, you know? Yeah. <laughs> And it's just like, oh, it's fine. Well, we'll you'll just face discomfort for a little bit, and then when you go home, you'll be fine. And then it's like, not too long later. Um, why do your lungs look like this? Uh, breakaway glass used in the movie, uh, where the the one that the cowardly lion jumps through at, at towards the end, if you remember, uh, it was made of resin and mercury. Yep, it was made of resin and mercury. Oh. <laughs> I know it's the fumes of mercury that are the problem, but that the it evaporates very easily. So it's just like, oh, gosh. Yep. We had to jump through it. The wall of mercury. That'd be a good name for pants. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Hey, everybody. We're the wall of mercury and get ready to melt your face. We're going to get ready to melt your, I don't know, melt your faces. <laughs> Eh, yeah, I get to eh, see it. Wall of Mercury, and then yeah. like everybody moshes because <laughs> <laughs> that's like the whitest thing you could do at a concert is like, bro, I'm gonna stand in the circle and push me, and then I'm gonna push into other people. <laughs> Mosh pit, <Whoa>. Wall of Mercury. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my god. The one mosh moshing that I do understand kind of is the one where they just run in a circle. I'm like, okay, I can get that. I can get behind just running in a circle when the music's really fast. The one where you get pushed around, I don't understand. And the one that's called Wall of Death. You know what Wall of Death is? That's where they split the crowd down the middle and then everybody just runs at each other full force. Don't ask me why I don't understand it. If somebody can explain to me in the comments why that's fun, I'd like to know. Uh, <laughs> Not judging. I'm just wondering how safe that is. Well, I'm, I'm just thinking the people who are willing to do that would make great stunt people. Oh, yeah. Because they're just like, oh, you want me to run headlong into like a wooden object? Okay, I run into people every night. You're missing out. Get that bag. <laughs> <laughs> okay, snow in the poppy field scene. A lot of people think it was asbestos. It was likely white gypsum, but reports of asbestos are possible considering both were used as fake snow in films and as Christmas decorations alike frequently in the 1930s. People were just like putting asbestos out on their lawn. Like, just putting asbestos out on the lawn, being like, yep, it's Christmas. And I, or, and with gypsum, I'm like, wait a second, isn't that, I feel like that's used in drywall. My geology knowledge is like, <laughs> has left my brain, but I'm like, it's used in drywall. But I also feel like inhaling all that would not be good for it's you. It's also not good, I believe. Neither okay, one is good, yeah. but it could have straight up been asbestos um, as well. Um, asbestos was a staple on set for putting out fires on Oz, and parts of the set and even actors' body parts were covered in it at times. Like, I, I'm, I'm just imagining the snow and the poppy scene, and they're like, okay, can we lessen the amount of asbestos? Uh, it's been two days since the last fire. We need as much as that as possible. Um, I won't say which set, but one of my friends texted me a picture one time. They were in holding on one particular set, and there was a sign in the room where they were holding the extras that said asbestos present. Why am I not surprised, though? I know, right? Yeah. <laughs> Yikes. <laughs> Just don't breathe, everybody. Just hold your breath for, like, 18 hours. It's fine, guys. Isn't they do in everyday life? Just hold your breath? Can't everyone do that? Because of how hot it was on set due to all of the giant lights, people would pass out and the amount of power being used on set caused brownouts in the surrounding neighborhoods. Uh, Can you imagine your power goes down? It's like, oh, yep. It's that Wizard of Oz thing again. <laughs> I, they're like, we're going to boycott this film. We don't care how good it is. It's also the 30s. So like, I, I fully know that electricity had been around for about three decades commercially at that point um but for everyday americans it was still 
relatively new as far as like something that like the everyday person had in their home. So I'm just picturing somebody being like, ah, look at that. We're moving up in the world. We got electricity in the house. Goes out and they're like, God damn it. (laughs) (laughs) Back in my day, we didn't have electricity. We had candles and and it's like dad why do we have all these candles in this house in case the electricity goes out but it's not gonna lights go out i told you the lights just go out and you just hear the lollipop guild in the background <laughs> faintly and you're just like damn it oh. oh my god family guy please do that <laughs> i could see family guy doing that the wizard of oz set has this sort of mythos around it and there are many things we think are true that are actually aren't and many of these rumors actually come from judy garland herself who was amazing at telling big fish stories right so she kind of was very she was very dramatic she exaggerated she was a great storyteller however sometimes she would kind of just perpetuate things that weren't true because of these things um it wasn't just her but some of them were directly from her for example many people have heard that the munchkins were drunks and harassed Judy on set. And this is most likely just not true. Like it, there's more into that. So like Judy actually, by all accounts loved and looked forward to working with the munchkins to the point where she gave them all their own individual Christmas presents. And they were like on really good terms. And then like offhandedly in a, in a, in an interview, she said they were trucks like later on and that just kind of stuck. And then I think somebody else came up with the thing that like, Oh yeah, they were super like inappropriate with Judy. And like, that probably wasn't true either. Like there's no accounts of like that actually happening. Um, as far as we know. And it's just like, It also has been said that the munchkins were horrible and horribly treated. And most of the actors who played munchkins said that it was actually pretty a positive experience uh, for them working there and only suffered later on when the movie had a renaissance in the public and people started making up stories about them just to like have funny interview moments. Oh, I know. Isn't that sad? Most of them were hired from circuses, um, because, you know, little people didn't really have a lot of opportunities back in the day. It was very hard for them. So this was like kind of the only work they could get. And like this literally made me cry the first time I read it. They A lot of them were just so happy every day to just be around other people like them because they hadn't met other other people that shared their experience. And I'm just like, oh, oh. that's so cute. <laughs> Ugh. OK, we're going to segue into trigger warning briefly for self unaliving speaking of the munchkins Uh-oh. you know where i'm going with this I, I i remember seeing a story about it previously there's a fake video that supposedly shows a clip of the wizard of oz where people claim to see one of the munchkins hang themselves on set thankfully this is totally made up who made this up i have no idea i don't know I, who made this who makes this stuff up oh yeah that's a person that killed themselves for like entertainment, what what do you gain out of this? I mean, uh, well, I I don't understand why someone would say something like that. It's I know, just right? because the stuff that actually happened is like oh my, like the stuff you said that was true was like oh my gosh enough that why would they lie about that? I don't know. There's like in this scene where they're like you could see it happen in the movie. You can't. Uh, the scene in question was filmed before the Munchkins were even in town, and it's most likely just a crane or other piece of set machinery just kind of flapping. Thankfully, it is not a person. If you've ever been scarred by seeing that video, it's not a person killing themselves. <sighs> Thank God. Uh, many of the little people playing the Munchkins were hired. Um, oh, I already, I already covered this. Sorry, I lost my place. Um, here, there's also a couple of just interesting stories that I found. One of which being um, Professor Marvel. You know the guy in the beginning who, like, the wizard is based off, like, the counterpart of the wizard, the guy in the beginning, Professor Marvel. Uh, His coat that he wears in the movie um, was thrifted from a local thrift store. Uh, It was kind of old and worn down, and it worked really well for his character. One day he's on set, and, and the actor playing Professor Marvel reaches into the pocket, allegedly, and I guess pulls out, like, a tag or something that says the name l baum on it which al frank baum was the writer of the original wizard of oz books so obviously they all freak out and they actually get in touch with this with the tailor from chicago who was like yeah he actually like proved documentation that he was like yeah i actually i actually 
sewed this for L. Frank Baum. And then to further confirm it, his wife saw a picture, was sent pictures of it, and she was like, yeah, I remember him having that coat. So somehow his actual coat ended up in the movie. Oh, my God. Completely by accident. That's just crazy to me. <laughs> oh, what a co- <laughs> It's a small world after, after all. all. It's, it's a small, small world after all. <laughs> they're, like, <laughs> they're like, curse you, Disney. We will make a better film than Snow White. This movie was really motivated by spite the more you re- read about it. <laughs> Uh, the scene where Dorothy arrives in Oz and the movie transitions from sepia to color where she like opens up the door and like Oz is in color. That was actually done by putting Judy Garland's double in gray clothes and body paint and putting her on a set that was painted sepia. And so she's the, the double is the one that opens the door. She's practically painted and in like gray clothes to match. And then like she steps out of frame and then Judy Garland steps in frame in the color. And then so like that was all done practically. I think that's just really cool. I'm a nerd for I'm a, I'm a nerd for um, for practical effects. Now, was the paint toxic is the question. <laughs> probably. <laughs> Jesus, probably it was. All in all, it took 22 weeks to shoot The Wizard of Oz. <laughs> 22 and, oh gosh it's like a baby how or how far along are you 22 weeks <laughs> and i'm like what does that mean? <laughs> quickly doing math in my uh, head that well four you know, and a half months you know what's worse is when you ask somebody how old their kid is and they're like oh he's 18 months he's 23 months and you're like doing math and you're like can you just say that <laughs> he's one- two years old please? <laughs> one or two <laughs> I, I didn't go to school for math. I also find it interesting. This is just by the way point. I find it interesting that in the books, Dorothy actually does go to Oz and come back. But in the movie, they imply that it was all a dream and basically downplay her experience. It was like, ah, oh, she just was knocked on the head from the twister. <laughs> the first use of gaslighting. Yeah, God forbid, like a female character has like a heroic experience. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Well, if there was a man who came in and saved the day, then it's like, yes, this really happened, Dorothy. But I, oh, I, I accept that it really happened and that they just didn't understand it. So she's, they're just like, nah, you're just a little lady who got hit on the head. That's the way I always <laughs> interpreted the movie. <laughs> the notion that Oz was a commercial flop in theaters has been kind of circulated, but it's untrue. Oz wasn't truly big until the 50s, though, when it was played often on TV. CBS, I believe, was the station that acquired the rights to air it annually and then it became a big it became a big thing um it also came out right before world war ii so it didn't do great upon initial release like the movie movies were not booming and also most of the tickets sold a a good portion of them i should say were the children's tickets which were cheaper so like they kind of broke even. It was technically a net loss when you factor in like uh marketing and all that stuff but then it became really big in the 50s, but it was pretty well liked. Um, they actually got a lot of really bad reviews at first, though. Basically, what had been said was one critic said that he literally was cringing in the in the movie theater watching The Wizard of Oz. So, like, even back then, the guy was like, that's cringe. <laughs> uh, I'm just imagining, like, a modern version. He's just, <laughs> just, oh, uh, the cringe level. I'm cringing. I can't think of any other terms to use in this moment. I'm sorry. So many of the props were th- just thrown away from The Wizard of Oz, too, which is heartbreaking. I know, oh. right? Um, but one thing that they did save was a pair of ruby slippers, uh, though they needed a lot of restoration because they were found wrapped in a towel in awful condition in a basement of the studio. And one pair also lives on display at the Academy Museum of Motion Picture. Uh, the ruby slippers were made red, I believe, just because it looked better on the yellow brick road. But in the in the book, I believe they're silver. Um, but, um, yeah. Um, I was kind of sitting last night trying to think of a way to kind of wrap up this story. I don't know what you say after all of that, though. (laughs) There's a lot to unpack there. There is a whole lot to unpack. And even though we've spent over an hour unpacking it, I still feel like we could still sit here and unpack. Like, the stories about, like, the burns that Margaret got, like, literally gave me, like, empathy pain. I, like, was like, oh, Oh. God. 
And the it's fact, horrible. And the fact that she played the character later on on like Sesame Street and stuff shows like her and Mr. Rogers shows her dedication to the character. And it's just like, oh, yeah, she wanted to teach kids that they don't have to be scared of her. Um, but yeah, it was um, it was a lot, apparently, making <laughs> that movie. And somehow it became a classic after all of that. <laughs> yeah, it's always fun when you hear behind the scenes about movies and you're like, it's even better now because I know what happened. Or it's just like, oh, remember that scene that happened? Oh, yeah, that pole exploded. <laughs> yeah. Do you remember when Disney Channel used to do like pop up versions of movies where they would air a movie and it would like pop up with little like behind the scenes trivia facts? I was all about that. <laughs> I it's no surprise that I would like hyper fixate on like behind the scenes stuff of my favorite movies. I remember on I think it was High School Musical 2 and I learned that <laughs> that daytime scenes can be filmed at night because they're like, oh, hi, it's like 11 o'clock at night and they're filming the stand sequence, but it looks like it's light out. And I was just like, what? And then you live through those scenes <laughs> where you're doing a daylight scene at night and you're just like, uh. <laughs> I was on a set where we had it was the second night of a miserable shoot sun comes up and we're like thank god we have to be able to go home because the sun is up because it was overnight they're like they'll fix it in post just keep dancing it was a party scene we filmed it till like 10 o'clock I have no idea how they tried to fix that in post oh god now now we just have to watch and watch and be like okay huh, how did they do that and then <laughs> <laughs> and then <laughs> the or the the there's like a quick movement and you could see there's like or they had like uh something covering the window that like shook off and comes back and it's like wait a second it's daylight outside yep <laughs> there's just like one frame that they're just like it's bright now <laughs> they've been partying until sun up it's fine oh and side note i wanted to mention this that uh my mom actually hates the wizard of oz oh yeah and i <laughs> shout out to my mom she's the best i love her she's she was in theater she's like the nicest person ever hi mom and but the reason why she dislikes it is not because of the story it's because she did children's theater ah <laughs> and and so she played the scarecrow about five she said in her own words 500 times wow so when you do the same thing over and over again like that you, just the mention is just like uh <laughs> yeah i can imagine i've had some outfits that i hate now because i had to wear them for like a week of filming and i wore it because i'm like this is a, one of my favorite outfits i like it it's comfortable after like a week of having to be in it and just like working for like 12 to 14 to 16 hours a day in it you're just like never again <laughs> oh gosh there were some times on the on a show i was core on again i'm still afraid to say like the names because it's just like oh no what if the people see this and they're like how dare you but i was core on something and there would be times where i just wouldn't watch the show just because of like the treatment the miscommunication <laughs> just just long days of not doing anything and it's just like why are we here <laughs> just to suffer exactly and it's just like well or, and it's like, well, you're getting paid, da 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 da. And it's like, well, if I get signed out at 10 hours when the rate is over 10, it wouldn't matter if I got signed out five hours earlier when you know you didn't need that many people <laughs> to do it. And it's much easier logistically for everyone else because, you know, you don't have, you know, the PAs don't have to be worrying about all the extras. <laughs> you, the catering doesn't have to worry about the food and stuff like that. Yeah. <laughs> but, but yeah. That's uh, that's the story for today. <laughs> the Wizard of Oz. Should we find something interesting to do in 1938 before we go back home? Yes. Oh, uh, so, some really depressing things oh, happened. No. Hang on. It's like, oh yeah, we're in the Great Depression still. So. Um. Oh, Orson Welles broadcast his adaptation of H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds, creating nationwide panic as listeners believe that aliens have landed in New Jersey. Let's go see that. <laughs> oh, yeah. I remember hearing about that, and apparently people took it to extreme because they're like, not the aliens. Yeah, there's actually a really, really interesting... I just saw a really interesting video by Stephanie Harlow about that whole thing, and it'll probably end up being a, a, a podcast episode one day because uh, it's a really interesting story. Um... And fun fact, the broadcast is archived, so you can listen to it online. Oh my gosh. Um, but yeah, let's let's go do that. Uh, oh, should I should I do the thing? I don't know why this this remote doesn't want to remote. <laughs> Maybe it's the battery. Yeah. Oh. Uh, take us away, TARDIS. Yeah. 
Uh, Bye, guys. Thank you for listening and or watching. Um, leave us a comment. Uh, if you're on YouTube, do all the YouTube things, like and subscribe and comment. hit the notification bell. And uh, if you're watching us, just listening to us uh, on wherever you get your podcasts and you would like to see a visual version, um, there is that available on Avery Talks About Stuff on YouTube.com. <laughs> so... Uh, and you can follow me on YouTube as well at yes. Gabriel Custig. And please watch my Fun Finds in Jurassic Park videos. Yes, subscribe to Gabe. Please. We love Gabe. And, oh, thank uh, you. <laughs> and uh, yeah, uh, rate us. It's not a thing that I'm technically supposed to be asking. Yeah. The, the rating. I'm, I'm behind in my pod. I'm new-ish to the podcast world. I listen to them, but I'm, I've never had one before. So Yeah, I think it's like rate like subscribe share all that good stuff do all the things we appreciate you for getting this far um but yeah we'll see you guys next time Thank you. bye bye